Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. Welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology. I'm going to look at a plant today that most gardeners, I think, would be pretty confident to just call a weed and they wouldn't allow it to grow in their gardens. So some of the plants we've looked at so far, like primroses and the fritillaries and the lungwort, are native plants or close to native plants. The fritillary was probably brought to Britain in around the 1500s but has naturalised itself very well and is certainly native to Northern Europe. But, the, but, but most gardeners are happy to have those things in their garden, going as far as actually buying them in garden centres and deliberately planting them. But this plant is not something I've deliberately planted, but I'm allowing it to grow in my garden. And if we just pan left, we can see that there's quite a stand of it here growing in my garden and in a back corner where it's not doing any harm to anyone. And I quite like it. And its name is garlic mustard. And its common name, or one of its common names, is Jack by the Hedge. And that's because it always grows in this way. You see these stands of it just growing alongside hedges. It can't invade grassland, it seems, and it rarely invades the woodland itself. So there's just this narrow strip of habitat where it can grow extremely well and you can find a lot of it. Now, if we just zoom in a bit more closely and see what it looks like... You can see these are obviously flowering. You can see the small white flowers appearing at the top of the plants. They just have four petals. And those little four petaled flowers are typical of the brassica family. So this belongs in the brassica family. And that's the cabbage family, right? So we eat a lot of brassicas. And in fact, this is edible. I don't personally eat it, but it is edible. And if I take a leaf and I bruise it, then I get an amazing smell of garlic, right? So it's not a typical brassica smell, it's got a very strong smell of garlic. And garlic, of course, we associate with a completely different plant family, the alliums, the onion family. They are famous for producing garlic compounds, but this brassica can do that as well, as well as having the sort of mustardy flavour of, of some of the brassicas. Because mustard, that you actually eat in a jar, that they are the seeds of a mustard plant that are farmed. So it's related to this also in the, in the cabbage family. It used to be widely eaten, it was a very popular thing, and for that reason it was taken from Europe to North America by settlers who wanted to have this plant, which they considered to be valuable for food and for various medicines, they took it with them. And that has created an enormous problem in North America. And this is not the only plant to have done that. So when many plants from Europe, which appear to be quite well behaved here and don't really cause a problem, are taken to other parts of the world, they can suddenly cause very big problems indeed. So I've brought in a piece of the garlic mustard. I've just cut it off and placed it on this tray so we can look at it a bit more closely. You can see it has quite large leaves with a sort of a little bit of a heart-shaped base and then they're toothed around the edge. This is a, a two-year-old plant, I know that for sure, because garlic mustard is what we call a biennial. Uh, that means in the first year it just forms a rosette that doesn't flower and in the second year it flowers and dies. So it never lasts very long. So it has these large, quite soft, thin leaves and you can see they've already suffered quite a lot of damage. You can see little holes in them where they've been nibbled away at. And if I move up a bit further, we can see even more holes here. So things are eating this plant. And if we move up to the top, we can see the sort of business end of the plant and a bug just ran out at me. This is the flowering part. And a lot of the insects that I've been seeing on here are concentrated on this end. You can see the little white flowers with their four petals. And in he here you see the developing seed pods. So they're only just starting to develop now. I must hold it against the white background. But you can see they're going to be long, thin, 
upright seed pods and inside those the seeds will develop. What's interesting about it, and I'm going to show some little bits of, of clips that I've taken. I've been monitoring the plants for the last week or two while I've been flowering and just trying to take pictures of all the things I see on there. And they're covered in insects all the time. In fact, this plant in its European native range has 69 different insect herbivores that eat it. None of them look massively impressive. Perhaps you don't even realise that they are having an impact on the plant, but they are. They are things like tiny little weevils, tiny little pollen beetles, and all those things are eating the business end of the plant. They are reducing its fitness. They're taking away its pollen, which means it can't so successfully pollinate other plants. They're eating the seed pods themselves. And one of our most charismatic insects that we're most interested in having perhaps in our garden, the butterflies, and the orange tip butterfly, which is a very attractive butterfly that you might see flying around your garden at the moment. It's white with orange tips to the forewings. The females lay their eggs on this plant and when they emerge, they eat those developing seed pods. And all those things take a toll on the plant and probably help to prevent it from being too successful. And that's one of the problems when we take a plant somewhere else and when we take this plant to America, it may well be that people just took the seeds and therefore all the insect passengers didn't go with it. And what happens in the States is you don't find all these insects on the plants at all. In fact, there's virtually nothing there eating it because their insects are not adapted to this plant and its unique chemistry. All plants have a unique chemistry and insects have to be co-evolved with their host plants. And that is probably contributing to the problem uh, in the States. And they've been doing some trials with some of the weevils that we have here that eat garlic mustard to see whether an introduction might be possible. People are very reluctant to introduce yet more things, even as biological control agents, because what we know is that although they're supposed to only eat garlic mustard, you know, this is a brassica. Brassicas are a commercial crop. And if those weevils turn their attentions to broccoli or cabbage, you'd suddenly have a new pest species to deal with. And so perhaps that's why that permission has not been given. If you're not sure how to identify a weevil, but you're interested in what it looks like, a weevil is a little beetle with a very distinctive head. I'm going to just draw one for you now. So the head looks like this. The head and the eyes are down here. Then they have this amazing rostrum and the antennae normally come off around here and on the end of this rostrum are the mouth parts. Most weevils eat plants and they use the mouth parts on the end to often chomp into the plants and then lay their eggs inside them. Some of them live below ground on the roots and some of them live above ground on the leaves and the little grey weevils are the ones we've seen on the garlic mustard. So what exactly have we seen on the garlic mustard? Well, here you see the sort of insect fuzz that constantly hangs around these plants, tiny little midges or parasitic wasps that we can't even see properly. Close up, here's a little pollen beetle, a shiny little guy who lives on the flowers. And walking up and down the stems here are two of those little grey weevils. I managed to catch one in my hand and here he is and freeze frame. And we can see that tiny little rostrum there, almost like a little elephant's trunk. When we took that plant out of the tray, there was this bug running around wildly. Again, I'm really not sure what species that is, but where there are prey, there are predators. And this is the rather handsome 14 spot ladybird who was crawling around the plant. And also things coming to the flowers, this an early hoverfly. And of course, the piece de resistance, the orange tip butterfly itself, didn't manage to get it on the garlic mustard, but here it is having a rest on a daisy in the lawn. So I want to finish this piece, not back exactly where I started, but on the other side of the garden, where there's something that gardeners will be a lot more comfortable with. This is Camassia. This is a North American plant. It's been brought here and it's grown very widely in gardens. And plants like this sometimes give me pause for thought. It grows very well. It forms very large clumps. We know that in its native North America, it can form very dense patches in wet meadows. And you start to wonder, well, what if this plant escaped from my garden and started to establish in the UK? Could it become a difficult invasive, one that we would then have to spend a lot of money getting rid of, like Japanese knotweed? 
And we just don't know. Gardens are harbouring hundreds of plants that have been brought to Britain from all over the world and rather little thought, frankly, is put into wondering which ones of them will become problematical and which ones of them won't. We know that most don't because they have to be cosseted in gardens, gardeners have to work really hard to grow them, but you certainly don't have to work hard for this thing. It's very easy to grow, it thickens up and grows very well and what you can see is unlike the garlic mustard I can see virtually no insects on it. You know, it's advertised as being pest free, disease free, trouble free. And what that means is that none of our native herbivores actually eat it. And that could mean that something like this, in 50 years time, rather than admiring it, we might be seeing this as a brand new villain of the piece. So what can you do in your garden this week? Well, have a look round. What native plants have you got popping up in your flower beds that perhaps weren't invited, but perhaps are there anyway? And can you see those tiny little bugs and insects, the little aphids, the little weevils, the little pollen beetles, all those things that we saw on the garlic mustard? And remember, that all those things are playing their part. They're stopping those plants from becoming too invasive and dominating everywhere. And they're also food for the things we like best, i.e. all those little birds that are foraging around your garden too. Until next time, have a great week.